Geo Music. All of the universe and life in it are vibrations. Much like tiny atoms, we try to understand the space between these microscopic building blocks of life. We know that over 90% of atoms are simply space, nothing. Vibration of atoms are a key to comprehending the shadows of music. The cycles of heavenly bodies revolving around the stars create a natural cosmic symphony. Without punching any holes in logic, we can downsize this holy song into our own audible spectrum. Considering that the ancient architects used astronomical constant numbers in placing pyramids and other sky view markers, one tends to suspect music as a key to unraveling such mysteries. What you're about to see is a demonstration of sound and musical relationships to the code. The code is a world grid system discovered by Carl Munch. The code involves the mathematical relationships of thousands of sacred sites, pyramids, and mounds worldwide. The implications? Global positioning of monuments thousands of years ago, with no known computers or satellites. Yet these monuments are here for all to see. And the work of Carl Monk can be confirmed with our own U.S. geological maps. For the viewer who is not familiar with the code, at the end of this video, we will present the information on how to obtain the code. It is critical that you familiarize yourself with the code before viewing this presentation. For musicians, we urge you to observe closely. We would appreciate your support. I would like to introduce James Furia. James has articles in national and international publications. He has taught piano and music theory for many years, and as a musician has played with such legendary artists as Chuck Berry and Skunk Baxter. Currently, he has created and advanced the theory of geomusic, the relationship of sound and music to geometrical and metaphysical shapes. And now, James Furia. I am James Paul Furia, musician and composer. Now let's go over to the keyboard. Most people are not musicians, so let's begin. This is the chromatic scale. It simply is just one note right after the next. This is where the note repeats itself. It's called an octave because there's eight degrees in the scale. In the chromatic scale, though, we have 12 notes before repeating. So you start here, one, and simply just going in order, chromatic order, one after the next. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And then here's C again, where it repeats the octave. So we have 12 notes in the chromatic scale. Chromatic scale is just simply going one note right after the next. These are also called half steps. So from here to here is a half step, from here to here is a half step. This is a half step, half step, half step, half step all the way up. To get scales, it's a formula of half steps and whole steps. A, ha a whole step is two half steps. So from C to D right here, this would be a whole step because it's two half steps. So here's the formula for any major scale in any key. Begin with any root. Let's take C. It's the easiest because it turns out to be all white keys. So you have C. This is the formula. Whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. This formula can be played in any root. Let's take B. B, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. That is the formula for the major scale. It can be played in any root, in any key. But it is a formula, a mathematical formula. I realized 
being a musician that I actually am into math, although I never was before, until I realized that music is mathematical. So to get chords, we're taking off the scale. Let's use the C major scale because it's absolutely the easiest one. It's all white keys. In other words, no sharps or flats. These black keys are sharps and flats. To raise any note up a half step, it's a sharp. So if you're taking a note, say A, and lowering it a half step, it's called a flat. So this would be A flat, this would be A sharp. Anyway, C major is real easy. It's all white keys. So we just showed how to get the formula for any major scale. How to get the chords is, any chord is, we use intervals. So this being a major third, this being a minor third. In other words, we can use degrees of the scale. Now a degree of the scale means you have first, first degree of the scale or the root, second degree, third degree, the third, fourth degree, fifth degree, sixth, and seventh, and on up. So to get a chord, say we want a C major seven chord, we use the root, third degree, fifth degree, and the seventh. Sounds like this. So for a simple chord, a C major chord, we have C, E, and G, the root, third, and fifth. So as you can see, it's derived from the major scale using those uh, degrees, those intervals. Now we're going to see later in this presentation that the third is probably the most important one. It decides whether a chord is major or minor. So if you have a C major chord, using a major third from the major scale, to make it minor, all you do is lower the third one half step. So you still have a root third and fifth, but just a minor third, because we lowered it a half step. So you can hear the difference between minor major. And the third, the third is what does it all. You have the same root and fifth, lower the third, and you get minor. So this is just to show that thirds are very important in music theory. They're what create the major minor chord. Now let's go up to the chart here. <coughs> I started looking at music as being round and I saw it as being a cycle of, of notes repeating, so I thought of a mathematical sequence. In fact, the only mathematical sequence that you can list all of the notes, these are 12 notes, all in 30 degree intervals. It's all of the notes of the scale, all the ones are there. But how could I list them without repeating? You can't do it in a circle of seconds or a circle of thirds because you repeat, So, but a circle of fifths. This is the perfect way to do it. So you go A, E, B, F sharp, C. These are all a fifth apart. Remember we showed earlier fifth degree of the scale. Fifth degree of the scale from A would be E. Fifth degree of E would be B, and so on, all the way down until you get the fifth degree of D up here, which is A. So hence a circle. Music can be round or as a circle because it is a series of repeated notes. It's like telephone numbers. You can make almost an infinite combination of a few numbers. Well, you have 12 here, and there's a, a, almost an infinite amount of combinations you can do with these notes. But let's put it in a circle here because this is how we're going to get our geometric shapes. What I did next was I filled in the circle of fifths with, in chromatic order. So I took the notes that would just come next simply on the piano and filled them in. It's maybe a little hard to read, but what it does is it goes A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E. So I filled in, making a total of 84 points on this wheel, which we'll find out later turns into a lot of things. But these, so now we have, uh, we have seven octaves, a span of seven octaves, and inside the circle of fifths, uh, in chromatic order, the fill-in notes. So... I thought this was uh, extremely interesting. I, I sent it off to many people, and we'll get into that later. This next chart is very important. This is what happened when I decided to see what thirds would look like on this geometric wheel. So we can go back down to the piano here for a second. As I said before, thirds are very important, major, major and, and minor thirds. Now. 
What is a third again? It's the third degree of the scale, and it's an interval. So this is a third. If you want to go a third from E in this root, this would be the third. And it's a major third, it's, it's a happy sound. So thirds are, are very important, and if we uh, go back up to the chart here, we see that when I drew lines of all major thirds, so I went A, and what's the major third of A is C sharp, and the major third of C sharp is F. Major third of F is A. So I just connected the lines here, and here we have the shape of the triangle in the circle. I'm sure some of you may know what that means and what that's from. I thought it was extremely fascinating that one of the most important intervals and important, you know, being thirds, uh, is a triangle. And so, what are minor thirds? Well, amazingly, minor thirds become squares. So we have, oh boy, G, <laughs> going from G, I'm sorry, let's start with E here. E, minor third of E is G. Going counterclockwise, this circle can work either way. Again, I forgot to mention, I am going to go back here, that this can be played in any root, just like music can. You can take this, and you can go, and turn this triangle around so that if that were there, uh, it would all work that way also. So we're going to show here again, minor thirds become squares. So we have E to G is a minor third, G to A sharp is a minor third, A sharp to C sharp is a minor third, from C sharp to E is a minor third. Creates a square, and again, you can go uh, put it at, at any point on here, even with those fill-in notes, anywhere, and it's always going to be a square. Now minor sounds like this. sound, <clears throat> but it's it's different than major. You can clearly hear the difference. A lot of people say that they're tone deaf, but I'm sure most of you can hear this difference. Major, minor. Minor's a little more scary here. Now, what I did was I wanted to make sure that I did this formula correctly, a circle of fifths, and I figured out, no, there is one other way to list the, uh, any, an order of a mathematical sequence of notes without repeating the same note. And the other way is very simple, even, even more simple than the circle of fifths, the chromatic circle. So I decided to blend the two, just to double check this whole form and make sure I'm on the right path here. And what I did was I overlaid, here's our circle of fifths, A, E, B, F sharp, and I laid over it a chromatic circle, just simply A to A sharp to B in order, just in order, note after the next. And what happened when I put these together, the notes that are common, all the A's, B's, C sharps, D sharps, F's, where all these points are, and I just drew lines, I didn't know what I was going to get. But the notes that are common, and when you connect the lines, create this shape. And I think we all know what, what this shape is. So, I thought that was extremely interesting. So, I began to move forward with this a little bit. Now, here's a doozy. This represents any major or minor scale. It is the seven-pointed star. It is sort of uh, an occult symbol. In fact, if you could come back here on the camera, we need to see the whole chart here. Get the whole thing in the picture. Now, it, it is sort of a, an occult symbol. I've seen it in some works of Crowley. I've seen it. The sheriffs still use a seven-pointed star on, on their badges or their cars or whatever. Not quite like that one. But it, it is a, it's a sort of um, an occult symbol. It's, it's sort of hidden, hard to find the meaning. I'm sure if, if someone does know the meaning of this, they'll come forward with it. But it is sort of an ancient symbol. Anyways, what it represents, though, in, in geomusic and geomusic theory is the major scale, and in fact, any major scale. So you could take this, and you could click this around to any root, and 
click it around and it's going to represent any major or minor scale. Now let's go back to the piano here for a second. The reason why is I simply disconnected the lines like let's take G. G major scale has one sharp. Now, why is it any major or minor scale? Well, because it just depends on the root you use. If you use an E root, and musicians will know this, it's called the relative minor of any scale. So if you take G, and you go down one, two, three half steps, and you use this root, this root of E, still using the same key signature, one sharp, you get E minor. So being, if you were to draw out this minor scale on the sound circle, it's the same shape. So back to the chart here. In other words, any major or minor scale is a seven-pointed star. Just for fun, I did the Egyptian scale, and I'm not quite sure what this symbol is, although I've had... Uh, some people give me some ideas on what they think it is, and it's very shocking. But anyways, for fun, let's hear, let's hear what this shape sounds like. So this is, I use the Egyptian scale to... So there we have uh, the Egyptian scale and what it looks like. Now, <coughs> I blended the major thirds and minor thirds to get this sort of a pyramid shape here. But if we go to the piano, I'm going to show you something very, very interesting. Back to the piano here again. Okay, now, why is this blend of major and minor uh, so very important? Back to our very easy C major chord here. Now, what is, how this chord is made is intervals, in other words, and this is for any chord, even minor or major, you take the root and you do major third. From there, you go minor third. So we have a blend, a blend of, of square and triangle of major third and minor third to create, yes, C major. They take any minor chord, and that will work in any major chord. A major is A root, major third, minor third. Major thirds, minor thirds. That makes the chord. That's how we get it. And in minor also, it's just the opposite. You go A root, minor third, major third. So it's backwards. So in other words, this blend. Another thing I wanted to say briefly on emotions is that a minor key invokes sort of a sad emotion. feel and hear that. Whereas major is happy. You know, playful and happy. So, but this mix, this blend, which actually, here's a great example of it, I call this the pyramid chord. That's a total mix of major and minor, a blend but in an entire circle. What I'm trying to say is that minor invoke sadness and major is more happy so when you blend the two you sort of have this um, version of, of male and female energies or sad and happy emotions or so happy I could cry emotions and believe me we'll find out later music and and emotions are, are very powerful let's go back up to the chart we'll discuss a little bit later about emotion and and music and it. it's very powerful stuff but that's the shape the blend there now this is truly the, the pyramid quarter this is what it looks like in geometric form what I've done here and why I call it a pyramid chord is it's a blend of major and minor intervals in a circle meaning I've used all of them until I repeat So it sounds like that, and again, I'm not uh, quite sure what that shape is, but uh, that's what this is what it sounds like. And I do I call it the pyramid chord. 
This is might take a little time here. This is augmented forts. Let's uh, go to the keyboard for it just a second. I know we're jumping back and forth a lot here, but this is kind of an, an important find here. Okay, an augmented fourth. It's an interval. It sounds like this. It's, it's horrible sounding. You could drive someone crazy with this. But actually, this interval was outlawed back in the, you know, medieval times or whatever. And that you don't hear it much, it, or in fact, probably not at all in classical music. You were not allowed to play it. And seriously, if a, if a piano player or a composer wrote with this interval in it, he was accused of, of being a, a witch or, or, you know, a devil or whatever. So why was this outlawed? Why this interval? Well, it's extremely interesting. If we go back to the chart here, it, it represents a 180. In other words, we have from E to A sharp, that's an augmented fourth. From D to G sharp, that's an augmented fourth. F and B augmented fourth. It's all augmented fourths, so, I mean, if you tilt it, it's an exact 180, no matter where it is. If you want to go here, A straight down to D sharp, it'll always be a 180, a straight line through the circle. To me, this is interesting, because this, this outlawed interval also... If we can get into the numbers just for a quick second. It's an, uh, something else that was outlawed is that 666 number. Or I'm sorry, it's not outlawed. It's, you know, people don't understand it or whatever. But uh, actually, if you take the all 12 notes and times it by the 180, you get that 216 number, 2160. Uh, 2160. So actually, six, the 666, 6 times 6 times 6 equals 216. Now, what is interesting to me is this thing of augmented fourths here. Uh, also may represent that great cycle number. So you're supposed to familiarize yourself with the code before watching this. The great cycle number 25,920. Well, it's 180. The great cycle, of course, is the, the ages, uh, you know, uh, age of Aquarius, stuff like that, which lasts 2,160 years. Where the, there's 12 of them, just like this big circle. And it's due to the precession of the, the equinox, or the precession of the, the Earth's tilt and its axis. Anyway, supposedly we're in a time right now that is 180 of that cycle, six ages from when it began. And so we're going into a new age, and this 180 that was outlawed, this interval, may represent sort of like the bent pyramid we get from Karl Monk, that, that equation um, 25,920 divided by 180, which may represent the augmented fourth, equals 144, or illumination, so we may be waking up soon. But basically what this is, is uh, it's a Maltese cross, it's the, the Greek temples from, from overhead are laid out like that. And this is also, I found this symbol in Blythe, California. Blythe, California is much like Nazca, Peru, if you know about... Uh, the Nazca Lines, there's another set of them out here in California, in Blythe, California. It's near the border of Arizona. And this is one of the symbols, just like that, this shape inside a circle. Next to some other stuff. Uh, glyphs in the ground that can only be, be seen from the sky, much like the, the Nazca Lines, which uh, will break out a, uh, a packet on the Nazca Lines soon. Anyways, this is augmented fourths. They sound like this sounding. Of course, now in our modern age, we can play it without being accused of anything. Probably a lot of those heavy metal guys use it and stuff now <laughs> to record their devil music. No, I'm just kidding. Um, let's see what we have next here. Okay, now is where we really get into some stuff, and I'm going to tilt it here so I may have to get a different shot. But this basically <coughs> is a representation of the cycles. Frequency. A, I'm sure everybody's heard of A equaling 440, or at least if you're a musician and you know a little bit about music, you know that the, the international standard of tuning is A equaling 440. And what that means is 440, 440 cycles per second, vibrations per second. And so basically what I did was I calculated all of the 
frequencies for each note, because this is going to be in, involved later in the presentation. The key ratio here is this 1.0594631. This is the number that if you take 440 and you times it by this number, you get the next note up. If you take the next note up, times it by this number, you get the next note. The entire site at, at Toa Tiwakan is laid out to this ratio because we're going to be what we're going to be leading into is relating this to pyramids to the code and we're going to see how music is absolutely in, involved with it all as we said in the very beginning of the little introduction everything is vibrations so so what happens when we decode these vibrations i looked everywhere not many people are doing this work and i haven't find it, found anyone that's doing it the way that i'm doing it so I've been looking around, and uh, it's very hard to find anybody that's doing this type of work, although they are out there. And believe it or not, they're all different. All, all these references, I must have found 50 different references to get these cycles. They were all wrong. Finally, I came up with the correct one, thanks to the, the help of a friend of mine who built synthesizers, and finally broke out his, his book. And we got this number, and amazingly, this number is, is again, the ratio for the Toa Tiwakan site in meters according to... This book, Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids by Peter Tompkins, which we'll get into that later because this also represents light. See, music is light, vibration sound is color and light, and this is the same ratio you can times to get the next color. So maybe in a future video we will get into color more, but it, it, you'll definitely be involved in this ratio. It's an absolutely a musical ratio, and we're going to show later how that number relates to the Great Cycle, and how, in general, music is related to everything, and the pyramids and the code. And uh, now we're going to take a brief pause and come right back. Before I begin this part, I would like to thank the very well-respected Carl Monk. Uh, without him, I wouldn't be doing any of this work. Also, I want to thank uh, Shaman Hannah, who provided uh, the imagination for a new standard of tuning, 432, which is a gematrian number. That's a whole thing in itself, a whole uh, sort of ancient science of numbers. Anyways, I uh, want to start by saying... Uh, when I asked a so-called mathematician with degrees in advanced calculus to help me understand math, I'll never forget that he was eager to help me until he understood my motives, which were to apply it to music. This individual got violently angry and refused to answer any mathematical questions. I realized that like math, music is a universal language. In fact, music is math. With the reaction of my math friend, I decided to turn to our Los Angeles public library system. And I was sure to find at least, you know, 100 books on the subject. I didn't find anything on math and music. Nothing on the uh, net either. Um, Kepler, Tesla, Keeley, Doppler, Carl Monk, in, in deeper investigation, one uh, finds the groundwork that there's some stuff out there. It was the great Edgar Cayce that said that the pyramids were built on a song. Well, that, that, that's a big clue. I found out later that music is related to the pyramids. In fact, um, a lot of people know that have been down there to Toa Tiwakan, to the Sun and Moon Pyramid, that they're set up uh, sort of acoustically. They're built in a certain way to be acoustic to whereas a chief or whoever could stand at the top of one pyramid and would be heard, you know, by the whole crowd. So actually people have told me you stand on one pyramid and you can hear them talking. It's about, a, you know, a half mile away to the other, to the moon pyramid, but you can hear them talking as if they were right next to you. So it amplifies it and stuff. So they are set up uh, sort of acoustically in a way, but I figured I could go on with this and figure out, you know, how it's actually related to sound. So now I want to talk about this for a little while. How is it that a five or six piece band can command thousands or millions of people with their music? Um, I've been on both ends of, of 
that side where I've been at a concert, I'm just compelled to go to the stage, and what is that magnetic force or energy that makes you just want, drawn to the stage? Um, and then I've had it the other way where people just come up and uh, they want to talk to me that would normally not talk to me at all, um, you know, because I was on the stage. So they're just like, oh, I would ask you questions and all that kind of stuff. So I was wondering what, you know, was that force or that uh, compelling how the musicians have been through the ages influencing uh, people since time began, or since music began. So music invokes emotion. Uh, and math encodes music. Tuning chakras, uh, sound healing. I'm sure you've all been to the chiropractor and they use sound healing on you. Well, there's a little bit more to it. I visited a friend who does sound healing with crystals and tuning forks. So that he will put certain stones, crystals, on your chakra points, seven chakras, which could be related to music too, you have seven, seven notes, and hit a tuning fork, put it on the stone or the crystal, and I've experienced this, um, I was expecting really nothing to happen, but for six days after I had this happen, my whole being was vibrating and I really was tuned. So like we said in the beginning, the um, planets all make notes in their cycles and that everything sort of is, is relevant to sound. But this thing with uh, sound healing, with with the numbers and with uh, geo music, we might be able to improve a little bit on sound healing and use certain types of stones, or I mean certain types of tuning forks, certain notes to uh, produce an effect on the patient. And there are people that are working on that that stuff too, but I've experienced it myself, so I do know that it, that it works, tuning the chakras. Uh, I'd like to talk briefly about gematria, gematria numbers, they're in the code, uh, 144 being the most sacred of all. I got all of these pages and pages of stuff, of letters that were sent to me, stuff from the shaman Hannah. We're assuming now that you've been paying attention to the code and know what the code is all about, that it's the grid system. Uh, proven by Karl Monk uh, through the, the latitudes and longitudes and the positions of monuments and mounds to be all relative to one another and uh, all laid out by maybe one master plan. And so all the stuff that I got on Gematrian got me started thinking about different tunings. We showed before that the international standard of tuning is 440. So what happens if we change that? See, there's a million conflicting references in the libraries of what the standard of tuning is. It was something different before uh, 18, the 1880s. And if you use 432 instead of 440, instead of these fractional numbers, you get basically whole numbers and geometry numbers that are linked to the code, that are used in the code a lot, like 108, 216, all sorts of things. So actually, we might be blinded a little bit by our international standard of tuning. What I did do with our international standard of tuning is quite interesting. You can find this in the code newsletters. <coughs> if you write to, we'll give out the address right now, Carl P. Monk, M-U-N-C-K, P.O. Box 147. Greenfield Center, New York, zip code 12833, and ask for some of the newsletters. You can find this one in there. Here's some of the, the linking that I did to uh, pyramids and music. What I did was I applied the cycles per second, of making A440, and I simply just divided it all into 12s. I divided up the music circle into 12s. And the measurement that, in this book, Peter Tompkins, Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids, um, they give a measurement of the distance between the sun and moon pyramids as being 763 meters. In feet, that's 2,053.333 feet. Well, 
by the relative orbital distance of Mercury and it through a completely different way. Uh, I believe it was Hugh Harleston said that there was the avenue of the dead, which is in between the two pyramids, was like a guitar, the way it was laid out, the, uh, the increments and the intervals, all being laid out to this ratio in, in meters. This one right here, this 105.94631. He saw that the uh, sort of like frets on a guitar, that this avenue of the dead was laid out much like a guitar into that ratio. I found that uh, the amount of feet between them is 2,053.3. Well, strangely enough, the note B lies at that frequency, that exact frequency, if you take it and divide it into 12s. So you can find out more about that in the newsletters, and it's all laid out much better if you subscribe to the uh, newsletters of the code. So that was one way of, of connecting it, and we'll get much more into that in a little bit. But Gematria, 144, some of these numbers are used. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Jordan Maxwell and his relationships to symbols and, and oil companies and things like that and suggest to the viewer to get that video. It has a lot to do with some of the, the Mason symbols and things that are related to the code also in certain ways, but related to how we are all controlled. <laughs> And uh, we can't really blame the government because we put them there. And it's about secret governments and lots of other stuff. But uh, definitely Jordan Maxwell would check out all that stuff. I, I think that we're in such a state of denial that we really need to learn how to become informed in the first place and find these al alternative information that is out there and that is real. In fact, don't just take what I say and... Um, Believe anything I say about the code, get it, write to that address. All the numbers are correct. It can be checked out with maps and everything, and it's absolutely real. So there's a lot of science. I mean, this other book here, um, Fingerprints of the Gods, I did a book review for this in Perceptions Magazine, and they have an article about the code in Perceptions Magazine also. But Fingerprints of the Gods basically proves or agrees with all of Carl's work without even knowing about any of it. This goes through a whole long series of explanations and proof and theories about lost civilizations, the highly advanced civilizations that were around, the ones who are responsible for the code and these pyramids and probably this whole music theory since it is related. It's another book that uh, sort of confirms the whole thing. So basically what I'm saying is don't just take what I say Go in and check out the information yourself, and go from there. And I want to talk a little bit also about the earth grid and how it's being destroyed and wrecked. Um, there's the site of more mineral springs. They're dumping in pollutants to this fountain of youth. Ponce de Leon uh, was searching for the fountain of youth in Florida, and the if you read the code, you find out that the pyramid. Uh, the pyramids in Giza, they encode that the exact center intersect of warm mineral springs and pointing out that there's water there. How do they know that? I don't know. But I do know that right now it's being destroyed. It's being polluted. It's being wrecked. And I want to talk a little bit about this. There's a site right near here where I live. I call it Cardboard Hill. It's an Indian burial uh, mound. And... Uh, I'm absolutely sure it's part of the code. It's in there. It was wrecked and destroyed and covered up, and they built a big house on there. So my whole point is that there is, you know, three things to sustain life, the air, food, and water, and we pollute all three. So we're ruining this, this ancient grid system. We're, we're ruining it all. It's all being destroyed, and I think it's worth a mention. Um, it's not only bad to ourselves, but to every life form on this planet destruction of these monuments since they're not completely and fully figured out yet. Uh, Viracocha. This might take a little while. Viracocha, the, the demigod of uh, Peru. Uh, this is actually where this symbol comes from. It came to me a different way and then uh, I was pointed out to it just like I was pointed out to all this work uh, through a series of lucid dreams. 
it's what led me to all this, and then it checked out to be all right, and I wondered what the symbol is, and it turns out this uh, Vera Kocha, who if you study the Nazca lines, is supposedly responsible for creating the Nazca lines, and all of the monuments and all these things that came out of the sky, it's this whole long story, and he's holding this symbol. But my point is, uh, if you look up the myths and legends and all that, Vera Kocha taught his lessons in a song. So we have another little tiny mini relationship of, of these sacred sites, like the Nazca Lines, which is in there, which is related uh, to song or music again. So uh, we're going to get into some more concrete proof of this, but here's just some little ones. In fact, I'd like to show you the Nazca Lines because... I had to go to about, oh, 20 different libraries to get this stuff because I couldn't find a book on all of it. The, not what the Nazca lines are is they're just miles and miles and miles of these lines that span out all over the place in Peru and um, they can only be seen from the sky. So... Carl just recently found out that they are in the code. And they are part of the code and one of the connections here. And uh, basically, Vera Kocha is the one who supposedly built them, although now it is still a mystery. We still do not know who really built the Nazca lines. Uh, the reason I mention this is this symbol also it sort of looks like, oh, this one on the wall over here, which is uh, one of the Nazca lines. If you want to get a shot or to zoom in of that symbol right over there, this one of the Nazca lines. And I will look for this packet. Okay, here we go. Why is this important? Why is this even in the video? Why is this involved at all? Well, this is what got me started. Through a whole series of experiences that led me to all this, I began with the Nazca Lines. I had some very lucid dreams about the Nazca Lines, the symbol. Let me try and find a good one here for you. This is basically from all these different libraries. I had the Xerox copies of books because it's hard to find a book with all of them, but there's about 200 animal figures also. Stuff like this. So they're all in the code. This one on top here is called the Hummingbird. And the reason why I even bring this up is that it, it, they are, they were just recently discovered by Carl that they they are in the code. They're very mysterious. No one's figured them out. Hundreds of feet, hundreds of miles long. There's thousands and thousands of them. And if I can just show you a couple more. I mentioned earlier about Blythe, California, and it's a similar uh, figures in Blythe, California that are just like the Nazca Lines glyphs or markings in the ground that can only be seen from the air. As I showed earlier, that, that symbol of the augmented force. Here's one. I don't know how great you're going to get this. On top is another bird, and on the bottom is a dog. But if you go out and look, you can find this stuff. I know this isn't a great shot, but go out and look up the Nazca lines. They're in the code, and uh, they're extremely interesting. They probably also have musical lessons in them, if that myth is true. Let me try and find one more here. I know there's a big spider. Here is the, um, the, the symbol that points the way to all the Nazca lines, this uh, trident here, which can only be seen from the air, just like the other ones. Now, the reason I bring up Nazca lines is before I even knew about the code, and before I began geo music or working anything with that, I was going nuts studying this for about six months, looking up the Nazca lines, reading about them, reading about Maria Wright, German mathematician, who 
was studying the lines for her entire life, found many astronomical uh, relationships to them. But what happened to me right after I started studying this is I got a visit from the Department of Defense, who came right to my house and basically said, don't study the Nazca lines. Um, I didn't even think about it until later that, you know, who was this guy? So I bring this up, it's part of the beginning of this work, is uh, actually a whole study for about a year or two on UFOs, alien abductions, all this stuff that you read about that you normally think is nonsense, that um, there's a lot to it if you find the right information. Because there is a lot of nonsense about those types of subjects. But there's a lot of good mathematical stuff too. And I think the code is probably the best, even though it doesn't prove there was aliens or anything, but it proves there was this highly advanced, technologically proficient civilization that existed a long, long time ago. So here's just a little pyramid model that I constructed and put the symbol on there, because you can see that it makes these squares around the pyramid. But basically, the pyramid shape itself this is in a, another book, and it's it's proven that it preserves things. In other words, this is just made out of cardboard, but the shape itself, you could put a, a piece of meat under this, and then another piece of meat out that's not under a pyramid, and the piece of meat that's under the pyramid is going to last much, 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 much longer and be preserved more. Why? Just because of the shape. The shape itself is what focuses cosmic energies just like some of the hats and like a dunce cap that they used to wear, um, which would actually trigger things in your brain to make you smarter. So these shapes, just the shape itself, is very, very important. And of course, everything relates to music because everything is vibrations and cosmic energy and all that type of stuff. It's all musical, as we said in the little intro in the beginning, that uh, it's all musical, everything is vibration, so there's this song that's playing out there with the planets. And I know we're jumping around a little bit here, but um, stuff like how did Beethoven compose after he became deaf through mathematics? He knew music theory, he didn't have to hear it, he just knew the math of music when, and was able to compose. So again, reiterating, math is music, music is math. So we're connecting something that's seemingly cold math that's, you know, boring or whatever, with music that's very, very emotional, rich with uh, the power of emotions. Uh, we were talking about emotions earlier. It was Eric Clapton who said that he didn't know that it, this, he thought it was an experience that only happened to him, where he'd be on stage and he would get in a zone and he'd be playing his guitar, and he'd, he'd be so engrossed in the music. And he'd be jamming out. And he'd be in this zone that where he could just do no wrong and make no mistake on his notes or anything, and really feel like he was outside himself. So that he's sort of outside himself viewing himself and he thought that he was the only person that this happened to well all musicians have experienced this and that it's it actually it happens to to almost everyone where you get in this zone this altered state from playing music why because music is mathematical and it's related to the universe it's related to everything so everything is music so what i'm trying to do is break this down and look at music on a a more intricate level, look at the numbers and the frequencies and how they relate, and we're going to get to that in a couple of seconds, how some of the numbers relate to these pyramids and all that. But um, it's definitely emotional, and uh, it involves many, many, many things. It encompasses many, many things, music does. So 432 is an important number. If you want to use that standard of tuning, I did this with that standard of tuning. Uh, with the Temple of the Warriors, which is, uh, I got this from the code, and the Temple of the Warriors basically has 20 statues or 20 posts. 
on top or tuning forks or whatever you want to call them. And Carl has determined that the CI, the center intersect of it, is 20, which relates to that. I found that when you use a 432 scale, the, uh, the latitude is the 2592, uh, becomes an E note. And if you, if you look at the diagram or go to the site, um, you can find out that there's, they're split up into four sections. 4-4, four, four, which could mean a 4-4 four, four timing. 4 could mean the key signature of E. There's also this one post that's in front of it that uh, could mean one sharp for E minor. So maybe see, saying E in that standard of tuning. Uh, I much prefer this 440 tuning um, because I found some really interesting stuff with that. But what is important is because the frequency can change in temperature. You can uh, have, say, concert tuning, you know, which is uh, 445. So depending on temperature, you'll have a different standard of tuning. So the standard of tuning doesn't matter. It's that interval. It's that way of relating it no matter what standard of tuning you're in. So actually, if you go to the Pyramids of Giza and you use 441, all of the sides and angles and feet and the height of it and everything become notes. So there's notes all over the place. Numerology or whatever you may want to call it, I don't know, but I wouldn't call it that. Um, in the beginning... God said, let there be light. But before he said, let there be light, he said something. So sound came first. God spoke first. <laughs> and sound always comes before light because light, sound is converted into light, as we said earlier. So I want to touch on a few more points before we get into the, uh, the concrete evidence here of how it's related, actually, in many different ways. I'm going to bring up a few other things. Um, basically, uh, I mentioned the visit from the DOD. Also, what has happened is this video has been made a few times. Um, the original version was sent out, and all the copies, uh, except for one of them, were messed with in the mail. Strangely erased, came out in black and white, ran off the tapes. Uh, stolen or whatever. So something's been going on with this video as far as um, it hasn't been able to get out there. So this is actually like the third or fourth copy. So uh, the mail's been definitely been tampered with uh, as far as this video itself. And I first tried, tried to make this. So these all could be coincidences. But if you read what Carl uh, wrote in reaction to my articles on the sound circles, he mentions Project uh, Harp and 30 degree intervals and all many, many, many things. You've got to look it up um, to where this, this theory can be used for thousands and thousands of applications. So there's actually thousands of applications for, you know, we mentioned sound healing, the code, but there's, there's millions more. You can use this for many, many things. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And uh, I'd like to take a brief pause before we will present the concrete evidence of the relationship of music and the pyramids. Temple of the Warriors Pyramid in Mexico. This is an overhead shot from above. This is uh, from Carl Monk. It's in the code. It's his diagram. Um, when we go into a 432 standard of tuning, this 25920, great cycle number, longitude of the place, and this 1296 both become E's. They're E notes. The frequency is an E. Um, so we may have a key signature here. It's you have 12. This is the, the, these are the um, posts or statues or columns that are at the top of the thing. And right here you have a clear 12 a musical number. There's there's only 12 notes. And over here you have a clear 4/4 four, four timing. Four and four. It's common time. It's uh, four equaling a quarter note. Four representing um, a quarter note equals one beat per measure. 
and one beat equals one quarter note. It's a time signature. Well, key signature is, is uh, giving you however many sharps or flats are in the key signature, so you can write it on the sheet music paper and the music can be followed. So it shows a key signature of E also, four, four sharps. Even this one guy here is one sharp would be E minor. So if you use a 432 standard of tuning, uh, this thing becomes notes, E notes. And it's saying E major and E minor. Does that blend again? So another thing that I was looking at was I wanted to look at the degrees of this wheel. We have again the, the original music wheel with 84 points, 84 notes around the whole thing. So to find the amount of degrees you could just simply take a 360, 360 degrees and uh, divide it by 84 and you come up with the number 4.2857142. So if you want to relate this to the great cycle number, 25,920, you uh, can divide, you take 25,920, divide it by 4.2857142, the amount of degrees on each note, and it equals the nautical mile in feet, 6,048. So we have a relationship of this circle to dimensions of the earth, another good uh, example of that would be to take the great cycle number 25,920 and this is how we can get the musical ratio. We'll get to that in a second here. Here's the Pyramid of the Moon from Carl Monk. And Carl shows us eight terraces, three and five. So you have a total of eight. Well there's only one key signature, it's a rare one, G sharp that has eight sharps in its key signature because of the double sharp. That's a little advanced uh, technical for music theorists, but it has the double sharp, so it has eight sharps. The key of G sharp has eight sharps. This is showing us eight terraces. Well, where it's located at, its center intersect. If you study the code, you know what that is. It's exactly where where it is, the moon pyramid up here. Its center intersect is this number, 6.4892458.81. That is a G sharp note in a very, very low octave. If we go over to the original table of numbers and you go down and look up G sharp, it's 830.60937. Well, that's in that octave. To get any octave, as you can see, 440A, it's, you just double. So the, an octave above 440A is going to be 880. So you just double. To go lower in an octave for G sharp, you just divide by 2, divide by 2, divide by 2. If you keep dividing by 2, you get the 6.489 number. So the Pyramid of the Moon is showing us 8 eight sharps and its actual center intersect is a G sharp note. Now as I said earlier if you take a 441 standard it all works with Giza so the different temperatures for different standards of tuning. One last little equation here. If you take the great cycle number and you simply just do square root, you square root twice, two times then you divide it by 2, take out your calculators and take 25,920, press square root twice, divide it by 2, that's bringing it down one octave. So, I'm sorry, bringing it down, yes, one octave if you divide it by 2. And you take that, that number and square root twice, divide by 2, you get that 6.3 uh, ratio that uh, in Hugh Harlison, Peter Tompkins book says is related to the polar diameter of the earth. Well if you take that number, that 6.3, and you square root it five times, you get this exact number. 1.0594631.
So in other words, this ratio, this musical ratio, this ratio to light and this constant number in this whole music thing is related to the great cycle number, which is in the code many times, as we saw, Temple of the Warriors, related to the ages and all that. So again, proving that music is related to the code and pyramids and in actuality to everything. So we really must look at this. This video is the beginnings of an ongoing work that will continue. We're going to show at the very end how to obtain more information on geomusic, if that's what you wish. So basically you have the, the humble beginnings of a theory that could absolutely turn into something far much bigger. Um, the, if the planets are notes and if cycles and everything are notes, and the code is, and they're all relating to this, it certainly has much, much meaning and value to mankind.